is not Sam Wrestling. Introducing your host from New York, here is Sam Roberts. For the first time here on the podcast, uh, he's the new voice of Monday Night Raw. Sounds so good coming off of your beautiful tones. Thank Sam. you very much. <laughs> Vic Joseph is here. Vic, I mean, it kind of goes without saying, but what's the haps? What's the what? <laughs> That's right. What did you just say? What's the haps? The haps? What's yeah. happening? Sure. Just say what's happening. Right. I hate TRL. It's Total Request Live. It's uh-huh. not TRL. I was See, like, first of all, TRL hasn't that, been on in like. I'm just saying, that was a big <laughs> thing for me years ago. No, just say it, BRB. No, just say be right back. Right, right. Um, I see. You're not an abbreviations guy. You don't like the abreves. No, I, no. Oh, my gosh. Uh, lots going on, man. I mean, it's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, apparently. So. It's wild. Yeah, you. you you are the voice of Monday Night Raw, and that's to say, obviously, it's you and Dio and Lawler, but you being mm-hmm. the play-by-play man, that's your kind of position. Mm-hmm. And I think it struck a lot of people by surprise, you know? I think it did, too. And, and I will say this, that I have had, you know, friends and family go, oh my gosh, you're the voice of Raw. Or, yeah. And I go, nah, I, I'm, the, I, I'm the lead commentator. All three of us are the voices, as you pointed out. I also don't think that there is a one single voice in the WWE anymore because there's so many shows. There's so many things we do. Uh, Super Showdown could be myself or Michael Cole or it could be Tom Phillips, you know, network specials. So um, I'm just throwing that one out there. If there was a voice, though, I would still have to say it's Michael Cole, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it definitely has to be uh, Michael Cole. But I, I do think that the selection... Caught a few people off guard. Um, I've gotten a lot of wonderful comments from people on social media. So for all those that have sent me stuff, thank you. Um, but I think it caught people off guard in a good way. You know, yeah. I, I mean, I, I didn't read. It's fresh. It's yeah. It's new. It's fresh. And I think it was nice that people got a taste of what you sound like. I mean, people obviously have heard you before mm-hmm. on Two Hundred Five Live and stuff like that. I think more often with the Two Hundred Five Live stuff on the kickoff shows, yeah, and yeah. when those matches end up on pay per view. But I think that the the sort of general population of wrestling fans really got a taste like a month ago or whenever that was, right after SummerSlam, right? Yeah, when, yeah, the, yeah. when the King got taken out by the Fiend Oof. and and you came in, and you know it's so weird. Because I take for granted the little that I've done, you know, in the wrestling broadcasting world that kind of the I understand the roles that people play sure. in the commentary booth. And I take for granted that people don't. Like, a lot of people didn't really grasp that what was happening there was that people said, oh, well, Vic's going to replace – Vic should replace Corey Graves all the time. Right. And I was like, but he's not – I'm not Corey Graves. I'm not – if anybody – Cole replaced Graves, he moved over. Yeah. You know, and, and took on that role of analyst, and you came in and took Michael Cole's role we just on switched, that night. We just switched chats. I love when yeah. I get the, uh, the tweets, my perfect announce team would be Vic Joseph and Tom Phillips. And I always go, we're the same – we play the same role. You know, facts, it's baby. Just give us the facts. It's just, two guys <laughs> giving us the facts. We're very analytical now. <laughs> yeah. You know, but you know, like it caught people off guard, and um, I again, I think it was in a good way. And when I was preparing, we and we bring up Tom Phillips, and I have to say that I wouldn't be prepared as I am now if it wasn't for Tom Phillips. Mm-hmm. Tom Phillips spent countless hours with me in the performance center in Orlando, helping me, molding me into what's right, what's wrong. Obviously, I put my own little twist on it, um, but. You know, kudos to him for preparing me for the opportunity. But it, it does sound a little different, you know, sitting in that chair because to what you just talked about, I remember, I mean, Rob, Rob was like the show that was like as my childhood, that defines my childhood is Monday Night Raw, right. beer baths, smell what the rock is cooking, Degeneration X, you know, all that. And that's why you end up being – thrown into this, you know, a uh, uh, title of the voice of the WWE, I think it has everything to do with the fact that for all these years, Raw has been the, the flagship show. show. Yeah, Right. So it's like, and you're right, that's the show that we grew up with. Um, and I was, I was thinking about you because, and we'll get back to like, you know, finding out that you were going to be on Raw and, and all that stuff. But I also think that people don't realize that you not only grew up a huge, huge, ridiculous wrestling fan, 
but that you came from wrestling, like you were doing indie wrestling. Yeah. You were like this is you were doing wrestling commentary before you got to WWE, mm-hmm. which is kind of atypical for a WWE play by play guy. Very very much so in um December two thousand nine. So I'm actually coming up on my ten year Wrestleversary is when I first so stepped in you don't like abbreviations. Wrestleversary? But you like the well, like I'm not gonna say anniversary. Anniversary Wrestleversary in the world of wrestling. It molds itself right. It's no, not an abbreviation. Right. No, you know, we'll get into and it later. Technically. All right, whatever. Um you know, so it's been ten years and I'm sure we'll get into what I did before, you know, the WWE. But I did everything outside of wrestling to make myself marketable for the WWE. So funny. To be very honest. Right. But I also knew that... Because you were enough of a wrestling fan yeah. to know that the WWE is attracted to people sure. who have experience outside of wrestling. I mean, you just take a look at some of the hires that they've made you yeah. know, over the years. And I knew that, okay, this is an avenue, but if I get there, I better have an idea of what I need to do. And I got very lucky... You know, people laugh when I say that Johnny Gargano is one of my best friends. The first day that I you ever stepped wish. in, the first day that I ever stepped into a wrestling show, mm-hmm. Johnny Gargano was there, and he has been with me every step of the way from my first show to him getting signed here to me coming right after him to him being already in the performance center when I arrived. So ten years ago, was like okay, and I did the first match. The first match I ever called was Naj the Wild Samoan, of course, <laughs> teaming with, I forget who, to take on Corey Winters and Corey James. Oh, the Corys. You're laughing. That's what they were. They were the Corys. <laughs> the they Corys. looked nothing alike. They were two guys <laughs> thrown together, and I was calling. I it. And it's like they share a first name. That's so it. So they're not even family. Nope. Like they just happen to share a first name. They look nothing alike. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I was calling that match with a, uh, a gentleman by the name of Aaron McGuire, and when I got done, I didn't know what I was doing. Mm-hmm. And Aaron looked at me and said, you're going to be just fine, and patted me on the back. And that and so was it. What do you do in that position? Do you try to just sound like the announcers that you grew up watching? I did it as if it was a sport. Huh. Because that's what I knew. That's, that's what my background is. So I called the moves. He told the story. I knew nothing about storytelling like I know now. I just was out there calling moves and, and getting lost in it and being excited because at the end of the day, and I still am a huge wrestling fan and i think that's also something that shocks people back to not only getting the job as they google my name and go to my instagram and go to my twitter and things like that they start to find out oh he's actually a fan of wrestling like a fan fan like a fan fan so um it's it's been it's been wild but yeah i'm a, a huge wrestling fan and i just started doing it that way and then you know getting in a car with johnny to go to a different promotion meeting um you know, a a former WWE superstar, Rhino, who is as close to me as anyone, he said, get in the car with me. Just drive with me and I'll teach you. So on my off days, Mm -hmm. I would fly myself back from wherever I was to meet up with him, to get into a car, to drive city to city, to sometimes sleep on the hotel floor or even in the car at a pilot. So, Mind you, I'm calling, so he's working going, for the NFL at the time and stuff like that, but um, <laughs> there's this guy out here just driving around. So Rhino's going to gigs. Yeah, and I'm and with him. And he's like, you just tag along. And he taught me. Because I like hanging out with you. And he saw that I was driven and, and that I just, actually wanted to do it. And I he see. wanted to help. So, and then, so there are people in the wrestling industry that are just like, I want to take this. Because wrestling knowledge is like, who are you going to share that with? You know what I mean? It's, sure. it's You have to. So they find people that like, that person's driven. I want to kind of pay it forward in the business and pass this knowledge on to somebody younger than me. Yeah, and and from, you know, first it was Johnny, then it was Rhino, another former WWE um, superstar, Tommy Dreamer. Tommy said, hey, I have this promotion I'm starting. I want you to call the matches. At the beginning of House of Hardcore. Correct. He told me that the day of the first show Mm -hmm. in his kitchen. (laughs) And, in Westchester? And and, and what were in New Rochelle? Yeah. Yeah, New Rochelle right there. The best Chester. And so um that's that's where it began. And then he was teaching me this is why you need to do it. This he was preparing me for the WWE, as if he knew that someday I'd end up here. Mind you, I'm still doing 
CBS Sports at the time, right? NBA Finals, World Series, things like that, while I'm doing this, and I'm driving myself, flying myself, because I knew how great of an opportunity it was, and I knew that I would have limited reps. People don't understand how important reps are oh my in God. calling wrestling. It's not that we just sit down and then turn it on and we just call stuff. It, it's it's not that mathematical. So that's, that's the room that we're in right now. That's oh, yeah. why the walls look like this. This isn't an upgraded uh, Not Sam studio. This is actually the uh, newly renovated broadcast room at the pc voiceover booth voiceover yeah, booth voiceover booth that's i forgot verbiage is yeah, important voice, it's very <laughs> it's very important i caught mcafee on the kickoff show he said belt no nope. it's a championship. championship brother belt holds up your pants <laughs> and then walmer on tv he just looks at me and goes yikes <laughs> but yeah i mean this is so i mean you're getting reps by obviously doing the shows but when you're not on tv calling wrestling Especially when you're first starting, mm-hmm. you're in this room or a room like this, watching wrestling matches and finding people to call shows with. Yeah. So when I got here, yeah. When I when I signed in January 17, man, for four hours Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, it was myself again, Tom Phillips, Percy Watson. All we did was call wrestling over and over. I can't tell you. How many times I did the same main event match mm-hmm. over and over and over again? Lots of Dana Brooke, and so there was a lot of Dana Brooke. Yeah, uh, and nothing wrong with that either. Phenomenal athlete, also Cleveland native. <laughs> um, but yeah, and, and you just there's only so much you can learn there. And then within four months, I was put on main event. Uh, a month later, I was on 205 Live. Six months to the day I signed and started, I made my raw. Pay per view debut, great balls of fire. And that's the pay per view to do it at. That was it. So and is that right? Because the cruiserweight championship match, that's when they started getting added to pay per views. Sure. And then that, and then that. Now you August, gotta, I did SummerSlam, right. and that was crazy to me because one of the first events I ever went to as a kid was SummerSlam '96, Sean versus Vader. Mm-hmm. And then I did Survivor Series. Then I did the Royal Rumble, and I'm like, no way. Within a year. I'm gonna go do WrestleMania. And did you not even want to utter the words like I'm not gonna I'm not even gonna talk about I'm not going even to talk about it. But this is a fun story. You and I are forever linked in my WrestleMania debut. I know I did everything in my power to just ruin it. It was awesome. Because it wasn't my WrestleMania debut, it was my second WrestleMania. So you screwed my WrestleMania debut up, you selfish yeah. bastard. My second one. My <laughs> first WrestleMania was fine. Mm-hmm. The second one was horrendous. Third one was great. You got me for the second one. I, I could only, <laughs> <laughs> I could only imagine what was going on in the truck because back to being a wrestling fan, I was in that arena in New Orleans for WrestleMania 30. Right. And I was sitting in the chair getting ready to call my first WrestleMania match, the finals of the Cruiserweight Tournament to yeah, determine yeah. a new champion. And I'm turning around looking at the seat that I was sitting in, and they're going, are you okay? Mm-hmm. Are, dude, are, can, you, can you not hear me? Can you not hear me? We're going live in 45. And I hear you talking. And then you lost whatever, and, you're like, and then you're like, ah, uh, <laughs> and I'm like, whoa, wait, what's going on? They waited for me. I turned back around, and all of a sudden, it's like three, two, finals of the Cruiserweight Championship, <laughs> and I was like, man, yeah. it was so cool. I mean, literally, my, my, definitely my worst performance. That was your finest moment. In wrestling, maybe my worst performance in broadcasting. I'm sh- on the I've, grandest I've, stage of them all, I've Sam. I've wondered a few times in radio, but never on the level. Of like, okay, and by the way, it was also the first hit. It was the WrestleMania pre-show, so it's mm-hmm. WrestleMania already the biggest show. It was the first hit that was live on the USA Network. I was going to say, that was the top of the hour yes. hit, and that was when we did the double. So we were on USA Network, Twitter, WWE Network. We were Everybody. on all of it. Yeah, and that, and was, that my, was the first face you saw, and he screwed it up. That was my and action is on. Oh, the, it was great. It was, yeah, you can find Hey, we're it. live, pal. Yeah, was, we were, <laughs> we were live, live, pal. <laughs> yeah, That was great. Yeah, but... Then you somehow, you made me look even worse by coming out of it not screwing up. And, and that's what like, I'm paid oh, to do. Oh, well, yeah, me too, but I didn't oh, do it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm, I'm probably really jinxing myself now, so the next time I get up on Monday Night Raw on the USA Network and I have a blunder, I'm just going to be like, ah, I Sam Roberts did. Yeah. Then we'll start. Yeah. And, oh, yeah, and everybody will know. T-shirts, brother. <laughs> everybody will know. It. Um, so, so that's a major goal for you. You have your WrestleMania match. You're going through pay-per-views. Like, mm-hmm. you know, 205 Live has all of a sudden become this, like, gift for you. Yeah. You know what I mean? We're not the, you know, not the most people in the world paying attention to it on a week-to-week basis. But what it does is it gives you those reps. It familiarizes you with this whole 
different product. I'm sure the audience that does watch 205 starts to become very loyal to you because amazing. By the way, amazing product. Those guys and the and, sh- and the show is incredible. Uh, I, I, the, the talent so much from Ali to Buddy Murphy to Cedric Alexander. That's when I was there. Yeah, was during those. And now you see. I mean. What Cedric Alexander's doing, what Ali ha- has been doing, what Buddy Murphy beat Daniel Bryan and, it's and a took it's 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 amazing. It's yeah. an amazing show if you if you never really given it a chance. You definitely should. watch it you Friday should. nights. And I think that's what it is. That's what it ends up being. Like it's not the fact that it's not a good show. It's just mm-hmm. that people there's so much wrestling that people have to draw the line somewhere and they don't give it a chance because I mean I've talked about it on the podcast before. I think if people did give it a chance, you wouldn't not watch it. Like sure. it's 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 that good, but. It ends up putting you on pay-per-view and everything. Did you have any idea? Well, what were you doing um, at CBS Sports when you were doing – you're doing independent wrestling yep. slash, slash traveling with Rhino. Yeah, that's it's, I have a story about that, too. Rhino's young boy. No, I don't go that far. <laughs> uh, so I uh, out of college, I started working essentially with the Cincinnati Reds uh-huh. uh, and, you know, and affiliates and things like that. And so I already had a nice – little groove were you calling games no i was almost maybe going down that path to doing that as a full-time gig it was brought to my attention but But you wanted to be a wrestling announcer the whole time the whole time my my entire dream since i was a kid was to get to the wwe right and even um my family the other day were laughing you know when i made my well it wasn't in august it was it was when i made my actual debut um, for Raw, where they, we, sorry, we ever doubted you. <laughs> you know, it was one of those things. So you start on, you know, doing radio, um, local high school games. That then went to, um, I did Boise State versus Michigan State all of a sudden. I'm doing, you know, the ESPN game of the weeks mm-hmm. and things. I went to CBS um, Sports. My whole other career goal was to do CBS in Cleveland to cover my hometown teams, radio shows, um, TV, sideline reporting, journalism, digital, whatever it was. And I got to accomplish all of that. And when I went to CBS, I had a weekend show. I was a sports anchor in Cleveland. I was part of their daytime, morning, afternoon, and even night radio shows, their national shows, and covering sports. I did four NBA finals. I was part of the media, whatever you want to call us, when they won when the Cleveland Cavaliers won the NBA championship. So, so that was not only are you covering your home team, but you're covering their championship win. The first one in fifty two years. Right. You well, know, that's probably so, on you. Huh? That's probably all you. Uh, it was uh, I'd take every credit. No, but <laughs> you know, I saved my credential. I still have the credential from totally. that championship year yeah. and, and all those games. And then uh the Indians for a World Series. Unfortunately my all time favorite team is the Cleveland Browns. Mm-hmm. As you know. And I was there during the Johnny Manziel days. <laughs> and so that was a low. <laughs> yeah. uh, the last season I was with the Browns, they went 0 and 16. Especially That's you, on me. So <laughs> especially like, when you know what winning feels like. Yeah, it's, it's like just, this is the other end. Um, of that. You know, being a part of Browns games at halftime, doing the halftime show on their network, um, doing in-game reporting on the network. You know, it just all sorts of stuff. Yeah, sure. Doing I did the Olympics for CBS. I covered the Summer Olympics mm-hmm. um, for basketball, and it was all to get here. It was all <laughs> to get to the WWE, and, and people, uh, well, that was a career in itself. I go, yeah, but look, I'm not muscular. I'm not going to be a wrestler. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to get to the WWE as a announcer if you don't have some sort of sports credibility. And I did all that to get here. But when I got here, as soon as that door shut behind me, Mm -hmm. that's where I left it. Right. Because now I'm WWE. Right. Now I start over. Right. And that's always been the mindset that I've had is whatever is the next step, Whatever got you there, gone. But I just think that's such an important lesson that, like, it's not enough to just do part of it, right? Like, you had this goal, and you lived the goal. Like, not – because you're not here, so you can't live being here. But what you can do is live the pursuit of being here. This is deep. Yeah, I think it's true. I I think that's the way people – it's the only way it happens – Unless you just get lucky, and, the, and that doesn't happen. Oh, it, it so, was it was a lot of co- – and it, it's not it didn't happen overnight. I remember getting in a right. car with a gentleman by the name of Zach Beatty, who was my broadcast partner for a very long time. We drove to the last exit in America on mm-hmm. I-75, Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, to call a game 
they didn't have a phone line for us to call back to the radio station. So we had to use a tape recorder and sit in the crowd. And I did it for a rep. And it was weird because that game when it got put on air, yeah, someone was driving through from baseball, or I'm sorry, ESPN, that heard the game. And I'm talking a city that you could spit and <laughs> reach the other end. And that's what got me to go to to do a game, Boise State, Michigan State. Right, and that would have been the easiest thing in the world to skip. Like, let's 100%. just not do this. I could, I could have been like, you know what, I don't want to fly in this <clears throat> right. week, uh, Rhino, to go to drive nine hours to get back on a plane to fly back across the country. To not even cover, do anything, to Not even do it, not even get paid, help right. him pay for gas, things like that. But I would never would have met Tommy Dreamer. Right. Hey, do you want to do this show? I don't have anything to pay you. Well, it's a great experience, though. I'd love to do it. But, th- but that's like, I feel like there's not that many people that would be smart enough to do both at the same time. You would either do a whole bunch of indie wrestling, and then after eight months when WWE hasn't knocked down your door, you're like, well, this is stupid. I'm out of here. Or you would get the jobs at CBS Sports and everything else you were doing, and you'd kind of be like, well, I don't need to do indie wrestling. I'm doing sure. CBS Sports. But but like the idea that this builds the resume that's going to impress a company like WWE. Meanwhile, even though indie wrestling is completely different, it is – an experience that's going to lend itself to make it so that when I show up in WWE, it, it's not unfamiliar. Oh, and there's so many. It's it, it was weird when I first got to WWE and at NXT. Ruby Riot I worked with her since my first day again in wrestling. Um, love her. She's amazing. Uh, speedy recovery. She's on the shelf right now. Can't mm-hmm. wait for her to get back. Johnny Gargano. We've already talked about that. Uh, Ember Moon. I met for Cedric Alexander, Tommaso Ciampa, you know, Luke Harper, uh, Robert Roode, Eric Young, and the list goes on and on. Sarah Logan, Ray Rowe, I mean, of yeah. all the people that I worked with on the indies that I turn around and I'm sharing a locker room with now in the WWE, and it's, it's... all because we had the same mindset. Yes. We weren't going to be told no. We were going to open every door. We are going to try every avenue because at the end of the day, our goal was to get to – the WWE. Since yeah. I was a child, my goal was to be a WWE announcer, not a WWE performer, a WWE announcer, to do WrestleMania, to quote unquote, as we talk about, be the voice of the WWE, to do Monday Night Raw. Mm-hmm. Those were all goals of mine. Yeah. And it's funny too, because like, it, it, it just, it's nice to see, because I've had a similar experience when I was doing like a whole bunch of indie wrestling stuff in Jersey. And you look around, and it's like a lot of the the people that are here should be here. Sure. Like you're not sitting there going like, oh, I never thought that guy would make it. You're like, no, I I thought – You that could g- see it. And, and, yeah. and it's so funny to me when you when you do get the tweets and things from wrestling fans all over the world, you shouldn't have this job, you don't deserve it, you know, X, Y, and Z. Well, what people don't see, and this is breaking I down – I get a couple of those every now and then. You know, <laughs> this, is, this is breaking down a wall – you know, I have a family member that's extremely sick. Guess who's not home with them? Right. Guess who's traveling on the road to work and then to read your crap tweets that you send me? <laughs> I don't need that. You know, it, people don't don't see that. When everyone goes, oh, you guys live a great life. We do. We're very blessed, all of us. But all of us have missed birthdays. We've all not been there for loved ones when, you know, they're taking their final breath. Uh you, people are in the airport all the time. You're delayed 10 hours, mm-hmm. and you've been there. Of then course. you get on a plane, you land, you got to go right to the show. You're tired. You've been up for 20 hours. You just performed. Hey, will you sign my book? Yeah, not a problem. Oh, take a picture with me. I'm not smiling, and now you're going to put it on <laughs> social media that so-and-so didn't smile, yeah, so-and-so's yeah. thrilled to be with their fans. You don't know the days that we have, and at the same time, when we meet fans, we don't know what t- type of day they've been having. Yeah, totally. And Five seconds to sign a book or take a picture means the world to people. So it's a very, it's a very unique balance that I learned in those cars, hearing the stories, what not to do, what to do, and that really helped mold me and continue to push me and to continue my drive and to see, wow, how they change the world. Being here, one of the greatest things that I've had an opportunity to do. And it's because of, you know, Triple H and, and Stephanie McMahon and seeing what we do as a company with Connor's Cure, Susan G. Komen, you know, Hands Across America. 
I started, and this is this was publicized, but I don't talk about it much. Uh, I started help or help start a foundation in my hometown that gives essentially twenty thousand dollars for four years to a student. It's and so life changing. The the winner of this year's um, scholarship, her mom got a hold of me and said, "You, I don't think you realize, and this foundation realizes that you've paid." for a year and a half of my daughter's school. I didn't think of it that way. I just thought it was, hey, I want to be able to give back Mm -hmm. because I've been given a platform. We in the WWE are given platforms to do good. You take a look at all, Titus O'Neil is a perfect example of it. And I remember talking to Titus about this before I started it, and he helped me. And he said, this is one of the greatest things you'll ever do in this company because it's about someone else. And it's it just, it's it's so wild to think, because we've been talking about this journey, and sorry I go off topic sometimes, we're talking about this journey of all the stuff that I've done to get me here, and I'm just getting started, but I realize the opportunities I have to give back, like Titus, like Stephanie, like Triple H, like the company does. There's also and, something about, like, your your dream coming true Yeah, that can be a little bit easier to swallow for yourself and can actually feel like it's a much more positive thing when you're putting positive stuff back out there, yeah, like helping I, other people with opportunities like that, like this this girl who mm-hmm. now has her school paid for. What opportunities are going to open up now? And, and what I've what I told her, and what I've told all the other students that are going to win when I go back and talk to the high school, is I'm an example of someone who lived in the city, sat in the same chair you're sitting in right now, in this school. That I went out and lived my dream pay it forward. The message is because of my friend Mark who passed away when we were 18 from muscular dystrophy. He had a sticker on the back of his wheelchair that said, make a difference. Mm -hmm. He never was sad that he couldn't, you know, he was always positive. So the message is make a difference. And being here with this company, you really can, you really get these platforms to go do good. I I wish I was uh, allowed to go do more, be a star rallies and, and make a wish and, and all that stuff because it's, it's, it's cool. It's a great feeling to be able to do that. You know who I learned how to make a difference from? Fatu. All right, I got to hear this story. Remember when he came out in that leather jacket and just make a difference? Fatu? Oh, you're doing a gimmick thing right now. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. Yep. <laughs> so, <laughs> that was about the time, that was about the time by the way that I fell in love with professional wrestling. 95? Just then? just 94 bef- 95? Yeah, and the, the story is this, it was 94, Bret not, Hart was not the champion. Years in the world. No, Bret Hart was champion. Yeah. It was the new generation. Of course it was. I was there. And um I was I was a fan growing up in the early 90s. I remember Heaven and Hell, SummerSlam, you know. Sure. But it 91. was in that 94 year when Bret Hart won the championship, beat Ric Flair, I think in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. We well, won the title. That was 92. Okay, so it was a little bit after that. It was mm-hmm. next it was next run. 94 though was when he had his uh, rivalry with Owen. So this was he was facing Mr. Hughes. Yeah, of course. And yeah. It might have been 93. He was yeah, that was uh, that sounds a like very 93. 93. He was facing Mr. Hughes at a live event at the old Richfield Coliseum, which was the home of a couple of the first Survivor series. Yeah. And what does Bret Hart do before all of his matches? Puts the glasses off his head, puts them on a youngster's head. Sure does. And on one night, no. I was at Youngster. No. The first show I ever went to. I still have them. I just told Bret Hart How'd that you score story. I just those front row tickets. My father, well, my aunt worked for the Cleveland Cavaliers who Ooh. were playing in the Richfield Coliseum. My father lied to me, said we were going to an ISDA function. What does ISDA stand for? The Italian Sons and Daughters Association of America. I don't know how he came up with all this so fast, which, by the way, the ISDA is actually a real thing. And what a great dad, though. I love that. We walked in, and he, I saw the ring, and I was like, whoa. Walked down, whoa. First row, whoa. Savage, I forget who, I forget who Randy Savage was on that show. I touched his back. And I want to say Shawn Michaels may have worked Mr. Perfect. That sounds right. May, maybe worked Mr. Perfect. I don't remember. But Bret Hart came out. Put his glasses on me. I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. Because it is the coolest thing. In I the world. still, <laughs> I still have them. They're actually in my arcade in my house. Now, are they pre? Like, did he sign them before he went out? There's his signature on them. I don't know if it was signed or if it was a stamp a because stamp, it definitely yeah. has worn off as time has gone on. Yeah. And I just got to tell him that story. I've been wanting to tell him that story for the last three years, but I always feel he's like, "Yeah, kid, okay, cool, go away." Mm-hmm. And I talked to uh, Natty mm-hmm. and T.J. Wilson. Mm-hmm. And I told them the story that you have to tell Brett. You have to tell Brett. 
So WrestleMania this year, I was coming out of catering. He was walking into catering, and we locked eyes. TJ had smartened him up that I was going to tell him the story. So I think he kind of, I think this is the guy. Mm-hmm. And I said, Brett, how are you, Vic? I just want to let you know, and I told him the story. And he kind of looked at me odd, and as he, he was walking away, he goes, kid. And I turned around and he goes, thanks for always being a fan. And, and I was like, you- no, no, don't cry. Oh, my God, give me a hug. And, uh, so, did you look back at him like the commercial and go, it was my mean, him, champ. It was my mean Joe Green moment. Yeah. Like, I turned yeah. around. And I was waiting for him to throw me his jacket. <laughs> you know. But, yeah, man, I've been a lifelong wrestling fan, and that's what hooked me to being like, this is so cool. So at what point was the idea of you being the announcer for Monday Night Raw – like, did that even seem feasible? Because I would imagine that as you're doing 205 Live, right. you're like, this is great. I think I'm going to grow within this company. I think I'm going to be here for a long time. I think everybody's happy with my work. Mm-hmm. But I can't imagine that you were going like, and I'll probably be taking Michael Cole's spot <laughs> within six months. No, I never I never thought that because you always hear the, you know, you think about the show Raw itself. Yeah. And you think about uh, Vince to Michael Cole. Not many people have had that seat. Yeah, and no. now I'm sitting in it. And did it ever cross my mind? I'd be lying to you if I said no, but I certainly didn't think it would happen. If you think about me, only being with the company for 33 months before you yeah. get you get that gig, and um, no, it, it's still it's still surreal, and it's it's it never really creeped in my mind. It was always there, but it was never something I was like, oh, I'm gonna do this for another year or so and then I'm going to go do raw or you know and I'm going to call the main event of this pay-per-view and it, it, for me it's been an opportunity to live out a dream to do a WrestleMania to now do raw I mean my first raw think about how crazy this is Sam my first raw I was sitting next to Dio Madden and Jerry the King Lawler we talk about raw defining my childhood well that's the voice that did it you yeah know? I remember when I first did a kickoff show with Jerry Lawler it didn't really click in until I looked at a photo after, mm-hmm. and I was like, "Wow, you know what I mean?" Because that is Lawler it's, is that guy. It's nuts, and I'm like, "Whoa!" I'm sitting here, and then all of a sudden, you take a look at the graphic that pops up. Still to come, Miz TV with the immortal Hulk Hogan and the Nature <laughs> Boy Ric Flair, and I'm sitting on the stage going, "Hulkamania is running wild." As I hear, "I'm a real American." What is this? Yeah, this is you know, literally. These are the calls that I made as a kid. It's it's. I have my Hasbro's figures back, yeah. and I'm getting ready to, you know, as my mom used to call the. Beep, 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 beep. <laughs> Boy, well, that's making me some money now, mom. So <laughs> jokes on you. Um, so did you? I mean, did they come to you last minute? Did you know that this was something that was being thought about? I was told maybe the Monday before or the Tuesday before. I was told a few days before Raw uh, happened that, hey, this is what we're doing. And (laughs) they called us into a hallway. It was myself and Dio. (laughs) And we kind of looked at each other. And then we, uh, is this a rib? Right. Like, are you guys serious? Like, here's the keys to the Ferrari. Have fun, right. and it's so. There's a lot of there's a lot of pressure because look back to Rhino, to Johnny, to Dreamer, to Tom Phillips, to Michael Cole, to the seat. I don't want to sit in that seat and embarrass any of yeah, any of those of people guys. Put faith in you and and entrusted you, and like, yeah. I mean, you don't want to embarrass yourself, but even more importantly, I think like you want to live up to the sure. position so, that people have put that, you that's in. one thing i want to let you know fans know is this isn't just a guy sitting in this seat that fell into it you know a lot of time went into it a lot of of sweat and thought and and i mean i got lucky but i take this very seriously yeah and i mean we've sat in the back during preparation and you know, to bring that wall down again, you've been, hey, what did you think of this? And I've said, well, here's why you need to do it this way. And then this should have been done here. And this is why. And there's so many moving parts to calling a match that so many people don't realize. And then when you put a three hour beast behind it, like Monday Night Raw, it's, it's, it's a whole different, you know, yeah. a whole different game. But so man, it, what a ride. Is it scarier when you find out you're doing it with Dio, not to take anything at all away from Well, Dio, I, I, I was working with Dio for a few weeks before that because he was on 205 Live. Right, but you, so you're working with him, yeah. right? You know him, but you also know, like, it's one thing if you're like, okay, this is scary for me, but I'm next to a guy that's been doing Raw for however many years, so whatever learning curve there is, he'll walk me through it. When you find out, like, no, actually, I'm you're, the captain. you're going to be helping... Yeah. 
it wasn't it, it wasn't nerve wracking because I enjoy being able to teach and, and and help. And Dio has been such a fast learner. I mean, look, what people don't realize he doesn't have a broadcasting background. Mm-hmm. He didn't go to school for journalism. This isn't like a pipe dream college radio host. That nope, he had no clue what he was what what he was getting into. And when we go into that voiceover room, he's all ears. And you know, we work as much as we can. We prepare for the show together. We figure out where we're going to go. We uh, ride in the car together from town to town, which that's a whole different podcast to get into. (laughs) She should be in here for that one. (laughs) But on 205 Live, he'd make a mistake, and i go, and we'd watch it. I remember he he messed up a graphic one time on 205 Live. That week we watched it over and over and until that you can't do that anymore or you're not even going to survive being on the Cruiserweight show. He's just a quick learner, and he's been fun to work with, and he's different. That's great, though, and that he's he took awesome. that and, like, changed. Yeah, like, you like got that's it. Where, that's, where, that's where you know, like, okay, this is going to work. Like, it's okay to screw up. And the king's king, by the way. King and right. I didn't and then even once talk. Once you're down the, and let's go. Yeah, once you have the king, it's like, oh, okay. Yeah, he'll, he'll, he'll pull you out anything. I mean, he could sell a catch a pop school to a woman in white gloves. <laughs> you know, he's, he's great. But, yeah, Dio has been very fast to learn. And the, the crazy thing that Dio and I talk about is – if this works, mm-hmm. you and I are sitting in these seats for the next 10 years, 11 Very years, possibly. I mean, 12 years. They don't do Raw as temporary moves. No. They don't do anything on commentary as temporary moves. Look at Michael Cole and how many WrestleManias are we going to do? How many moments are, are, are we going to call? That's what I'm looking forward to is the moments that we're going to have. That yeah. we're going to be, I don't like to say immortalized for, but look, when Daniel Bryan won the title, at WrestleMania, it's the miracle on Bourbon Street. Mm-hmm. Seth Rollins, the heist of the century. You remember those calls. I mean, go back to the nineteen ninety. Go back to Hogan Andre. Yeah. You know, you you the one that stands out for Vince is unbelievable, which <laughs> Easter egg, I drop that in every now and again. That's awesome. Um But yeah, I mean, think about like JR's calls during the Mankind Undertaker Hell in a Cell match. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't think you could argue that that match m- is JR's legacy, you know, not to take anything away from him, but half of his catchphrases are from that match alone, mm-hmm. and those are the words that paint the picture of one of the most, uh, you know, famous matches of all time. So we're, we're sitting here and we're thinking, man, this is a whole new level that we never even fathom. And, and I've done, I covered a, a championship in my hometown city. Mm-hmm. I was with the Browns. I've done all the major sports events. I've called a match. I've called a championship match. At WrestleMania, but to think of having that legacy is scary too. At the same time, so we're recording this before Hell in a Cell. Mm-hmm. Um, so you got a pay per view coming up that you've got a lot of matches that you're responsible for. Calling two Hell in a Cell matches. Two By Hell the way, in a Cell matches. never called a Hell in a Cell match. Of course not. I've only called one match longer than forty minutes. <laughs> Shout out Walter Tyler Bate, Takeover Cardiff for the NXT UK brand. Dio's never called a match over 20 minutes. Right. I mean, it's like it's, there's a lot of combustible elements that are going to come to play here. I love it. I love it. Cell. But so mm-hmm. as we're talking, aside from the Raw that you filled in when Jerry Lawler, you know, got the thing with The Fiend, you've done one full episode. Correct. Of Monday Night Raw. You've done one episode as this is my show, you know, the show that you're on. Um, was there a moment? On that season premiere episode or just something where you were like, oh, okay, this is real or, oh, okay, this is what this is. It became real to me when Jerry Lawler's music hit and they said, guys, go. And you heard the ring announcer go, please welcome your raw commentary team, Vic Joseph. And I was like, oh, this is real. (laughs) And you go to the table and you sit at that raw announce desk. And you put the headset on, and the pyro's going off around you. Which, and by the, the way, is hot. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't there before, right? And, nope. And the pyro's it's back. so hot. Yeah. And the crowd's going nuts. Ray Mysterio comes out. Mm-hmm. I'm like, man, I remember watching Ray and Eddie in the cruiserweight, I mean, matches these guys had in WCW. And then all of a sudden, those chords hit, and I turn to my left, and here comes the beast. And then Brock Lesnar decimates everybody, and I'm like, this is my job. Here we go. This is it. We're off and running. <laughs> here we go. By the way, fast forward. Here comes Hulk Hogan and Ric Flair. Yeah. By the way, fast forward. Here's a universal championship match. It's just, 
it's it's crazy to think that, and it's I don't think it still has hit me because it hits me in waves, mm-hmm. where I'll get a message from my buddies in college. We used to make hamburger helper beef stroganoff mm-hmm. and watch Raw. I remember watching the 25th anniversary. You know, you know, being there for a couple of these huge anniversaries of Raws, and then remembering, oh, Raw 1000. I was in college, right, and I was sitting in my dorm area living whatever the heck it's called with my roommates and going to these shows and it's going to be fun because coming up in a few weeks raw is in cleveland oh that's awesome it will be my one two three fourth raw as the guy and i have i was i was at that raw when i was in that arena when Vince McMahon purchased WCW, I was at that Raw. That, that happened was in, in Cleveland, Cleveland Ohio. That's so great. Uh, I was at that arena when the Hardy Boys and Edge and Christian had the Terry Reynolds Invitational Final Ladder Match. At the pay-per-view. At the pay-per-view, No Mercy, which yeah. spawned the greatest wrestling video game in history, but that's a different podcast for a different day. Yeah, my favorite ladder match of all time. I was there for Unforgiven 08 when they had the championship scramble. Yep. When Brian Kendrick won the World Heavyweight Championship, shout out BK, uh, for a couple of minutes. Love Brian Kendrick. I was there for SummerSlam 96, Vader Sean, which also had the first Boiler Room Brawl. Of course it did. So, I mean, the first SmackDown. Yeah. You, there's the all first, these things I was so at. So you were in the audience for that. That was the one when uh, they didn't quite have the uh, technology of showing the audience what was going on in the Boiler Room down. And they just wheeled out like the type of TVs that you would get. During a, a you had like it, a was very, it was very it was very odd. Like I think one I think like the vit- tr- Titan Tron that they had back in the day, which was like a video board of like six TVs. <laughs> like that's what played you the match. Yeah. Um. But you know, I remember sitting in the arena for all those shows, covering the Cavaliers, their NBA championship, being there when they raised the banner, and now to go back to do Monday Night Raw mm-hmm. and to come out. Through that curtain being announced, I hope they say from Cleveland, Ohio, just so I get the cheap pop. In. <laughs> you know, it's it's crazy, man. You think of all the th- the things personally that I have left that I want to do. That's certainly up there. Well, you and said before mark. we did this, that you have one more goal. And when you know, obviously, there's a like hundred and fifty thousand things you want to do, mm-hmm. but in terms of goals, there's one more. Yeah, uh, I'm glad we brought this up. So I've done everything career-wise. We've talked about that already today. Yeah, I've done mean, it all. WWE now raw, like yeah. There's little silly things like I'm on a Topps trading card. I remember collecting Topps trading cards. Mm-hmm. I used to have fake autograph signings where I would ruin <laughs> Jerry Rice cards because I was fake putting my name on it in mm-hmm. the living room of my house in Cleveland when I was, you know, seven. Can I tell you something? Yeah, Topps made me a trading card, but go on. Well, that's cool. <laughs> Do you have it? Uh, I mean, I am a house. Yeah, they sent me like. A bunch of them because I did an ad or something. But yeah, no, I they sent me some and I just was staring at these things. I put one in a nice little case. So in side note, in my arcade in my house, I have Bret Hart's mm-hmm. um, sunglasses, my trading card, the 1995 frame of Shawn Michaels winning the Royal Rumble as his foot is dangling. It's mm-hmm. the actual film that's, oh, that's so slid cool. into yeah, a, yeah. a collector's piece. What else is in that? I think that's it. Oh, the Pogs? Remember the little gimmicks? I have the WWF ones. Those are in there. Matt Caps and I don't think it – maybe it was Matt Caps and Slammers. Something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They call them Pogs. They call them Matt Caps. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, So I have all those in there. And then up from that are all my WWF, WWE Hasbros. That's a whole different thing, but that's a whole – You have the whole set? I'm missing a few. I can't find Ludwig Borga. And when I, I did find trouble, him, it was three hundred dollars. I'm not oh, yeah, paying three hundred dollars for a Ludwig Borga. You get the mailaways? I don't have the mailaways either. Yeah, yeah, the Are you on that? Oh, you got mailaways those? get pricey. I got the Hogan. Ryder has the. I think Ryder was telling me about some of those. Oh yeah, Ryder's got everything. He's got a bunch of things. You yeah. talk about a guy living a dream. Ryder sent lives me in a, a toy house. Ryder sent me a Ludwig Borga because he was so fed up with mine missing a finger. Ryder sent you a Ludwig Borga. Well, guess who's getting a text message as soon as this is getting done? <laughs> <laughs> Ryder's getting hit up. Find me a Ludwig Borga. Um, but you know, you do all those things. This is a selfish thing for me. Is going back and tying it to the start with Johnny Gargano. Mm-hmm. I want to call Johnny Gargano's WrestleMania debut, or just a WrestleMania match in general. 
That's the that's you, that's, that's the last, last thing that I have that I want to do. I've done WrestleMania. Everyone says, "Oh, you got to do the WrestleMania main event." Yeah, hundred percent. I would love to do that. But in the Johnny Gargano main event, in the pipe dream fairy tale life that I've been living for the last thirty some years, if I could call Johnny's match on a WrestleMania, I don't care if he's in the Battle Royal. Mm-hmm. I don't care if it's a pre-show. I don't care what it is. That to me would be two strangers coming together however many years has passed mm-hmm. that became lifelong friends i was in his wedding you know to have that moment would certainly rank very high on my list of to do's because again not many people get to say that they got to do what johnny and i are doing at this level let alone share in that moment so do you think about the fact that as of at the time we're having this conversation, as of two weeks ago, maybe even a little less than two weeks ago, it's actually fairly attainable. Like it is. It's it's so I did the um, takeover Chicago was the first time I ever did a long my own try to fill in for Morrow. That's right on that takeover. That's right, and this ties back into the journey that Johnny and I have been on. My first takeover was Johnny main eventing. It was him and Tommaso, right. two guys that are family to me. It, it was crazy to think. The first time he did Madison Square Garden, I was there. So it's all these things we've tied in together, which have been weaved just so ironically that when he goes to WrestleMania, I just want to call one match of Johnny's mm-hmm. at WrestleMania. I've uh, I got to call Candice LeRae, his wife's. She's another f- close friend of mine, getting to call her a WrestleMania debut this past year in the Women's Battle oh, Royal. Right. Um, another one for me was to call Ruby Riot. WrestleMania match. I got to do that. And it, it just shows the bond that's created between total strangers that find their love of this industry and this sport and this art that grow together, that come up the ranks together, that get here together. And now for me, being able to call and voice that Gargano moment at WrestleMania is the last bucket list thing wild dream scenario it's not even that wild anymore you know for me it's not it's not that wild but that that's something that would be very meaningful to me do you like storytelling better or calling moves better i used to love calling moves uh more so the high impact moves but yeah. now there's something about storytelling that has kind of bitten me a little bit but what i'm trying to do a little bit differently is tell you the story while calling the moves that's great and that's kind of what I started doing on 205 Live, what I started doing on the NXT UK, and what I'm hopefully going to bring to uh, Monday nights while sprinkling in a Hall of Famer and, and Dio Madden. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not a bad combination. Um, who who delivered the good news to you? Michael Cole. Michael Cole also called me when I signed my contract, or when I was when he announced that he was hiring me. He called my phone. I missed the, the call. Mm-hmm. He then sent me a text message. Mm-hmm. He then asked me if I, he had the right number because he had two numbers at the time because I switched phones. And he left me a voicemail and said, call me. <laughs> and I, I immediately saw the call. I ran outside. I was at my dad's. And I, I called back. I said, Mr. Cole, I'm so sorry. And he goes, what the heck? I go, I've been trying to call you all morning. I go, I'm so sorry. And he's like, "What is this the number you want me to call? And I said, yep. He goes, all right, you want to come work for us? Sorry, this isn't romantic. Yes or no? And I said, yes. He goes, great, X, Y, Z. And he hung up the phone. And I was like, oh, man, that was so cool. He was, like, he was trying to get a hold of me for four hours. And yeah. finally, he was on the treadmill running when I called him back. So I'm like, oh, my God, he's working out right now. He's got so many things to do. Yeah. I'm this a-hole who didn't answer the phone. And sorry it wasn't more romantic. And I, I always laugh about that. And then he delivered the news to Dio and I. He pulled us out of a production meeting on a Monday or a Tuesday before Raw, so it was like a week before, six right. days before, and he said, "Here's the deal," and he told us, "And okay, go get him." And he walked away. And Michael Cole's a man of very few words. He's, yeah. he's straight to the point. He's got too much stuff going on, and that's kind of how we found out. And then uh, I, I still haven't properly celebrated. Like, oh my gosh, because it just moment. became real. And now, but now, it, it, now that it became real, now you're going. Yeah, now, now I'm going, yeah. and and to make it real, you know, I need like the Corey Graves of the world and the and the Michael Mansuris to be around to, you know, do it proper. And you know, Corey's on SmackDown, and 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 Michael's going back and forth a lot with NXT. So, 
it, it might take a while to have that proper celebration. Maybe it'll happen at Survivor Series. Yeah. Maybe we'll go to Chicago. We'll go to, what's that pizza place? Giordano's or something? Yeah. Giordano's? Yeah. The Deep Dish Brothers? You said in the uh, a while back, uh, we were talking about Rhino, and I was talking about traveling with him, and you were like, yeah, and there's a story there. Oh, man. And then you didn't tell the yeah, story. Well, I wanted you to set me up for it, but I actually forgot. So Rhino's a... a, a you, last professional broadcaster. That's very true. Yeah. That's very true. Um, that's actually a very good point. You know Rhino. You've yeah. met him enough. Mm-hmm. He's a germaphobe. Mm-hmm. Always washes his hands. It's the, you know puts the fist out because he doesn't want to shake that unless he Which knows you. Which is great because you wouldn't think a man beast would be a germaphobe. A guy who's you know six foot, three hundred pounds, yeah. throws dudes around for a living. Yeah. No, if you walk into his house, you have to roll your pant legs up so that your pants don't drag on his floor because he doesn't want the dirt from the bottom of your jeans and wherever you've been to get on his floor. This is I a mean, true story, by the way. I he also now it. lives on a boat. I'm just throwing that one out there as well. He's a, he's a marina guy now. He owns a marina. Big he Daddy's boatyard. Boat. Lives on his boat. And when it's too cold, he goes into his house, which is on the marina. But he prefers his boat. Loves his boat. <laughs> he prefer, much rather prefers to stay on the boat. So he's a big neat freak. We're getting in basically the gist. So he gets into the car, and he teaches me early on, the car is your home on the road. You don't have a messy car because you have a messy home. And you never know what show you're going to go to. You never know who's going to be there that's going to need a ride. And if their first impression is they're getting in this junk-filled, garbage-infested car... You're going to have a bad first impression. So the car is always clean. It's a fair point. It is a fair point. It's a fair point. So I think the loop we did was um, New York, Philly, Baltimore. Mm -hmm. I don't remember the order. I think Baltimore was the last day. And I had to get back from Baltimore to Cleveland. By the way, Rhino loves to drive. He did not fly. He loves to drive. Even when he was in the WB, he preferred to drive. So we made all the towns, and I had to get back to Cleveland because I had an NFL Browns game because I was doing CBS at the time. I had to be at the stadium at 8 a.m. So I had to drive from an indie show in Baltimore, <laughs> which probably ended at 11 or 12, Yeah, drive straight through to Cleveland to shower change to drive downtown to actually go to work Yeah, with no sleep right. after a weekend of wrestling. Right. Okay. <laughs> so we get there. He stays at my house. He gets in his car. He leaves. Next day, I get in my car, which is now Monday. Go to work, come back. This is the summer, so this is his training camp in a preseason game. <laughs> the heck is that smell? Wednesday goes by. Thursday goes by. Friday, I can't even sit in the car. I'm going to get sick. It's that nauseating. To the point where I've looked through this car, I can't find anything. Did did I leave an open can of, like, what is this smell? Is there nasty socks in here? Did Ryan leave his gear? I'm cleaning this car. The windows are down. You could, it just, you could see the green odor coming out of the car. It was unbearable. Mm-hmm. You couldn't really smell it, and it was, it, was making you, it was making you sick. And so I reach underneath his seat that he was sitting in. There's a half-eaten piece of tilapia. <laughs> There's been fish in my car for seven days in the summer. And I called him, and I go, dude, what the hell? He go, oh, my fault. Still to this day, he says it was an accident. No way. Still, it was he's definitely a, on purpose. It was definitely on purpose. He would not have done that. Um, no. He would not have done that by accident. It was on purpose, 100%. So that kind of kind of got me. And then another time, he stole my uh, – he hid my tie – it was one of the first live events I was on for Raw, mm-hmm. and I was had my tie and my notes, my notebook with everyone's stats on it. He hid that from me. <laughs> and I go, where's my – I can't find it. He goes, I don't know, man. You're, you're clumsy. I go, ah. And he didn't tell me where it was until the end of the show. I had to go through the – he's like, I just – yeah, see, you could do it without him. <laughs> he's like, but I didn't hide it from you. Valuable lesson. Like, oh, my gosh. So yeah, those are the two – I'll That's never great. forget that one. That car smelled so bad. That's great. Even a lot after that. I had to get rid of it. Well, Vic Joseph, congratulations on everything. I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to come on this You're show. You're crushing it. Please. I appreciate you coming I on I just the like show. let your listeners know I've asked you six times to come on the show. You've denied me all six times. That's right. And then when you're like, oh, wait, you're going to be on you're on Raw now? Hey, would you like to do this? Could you come do the show? Uh, no. no all, all joking aside, <laughs> I do appreciate the time to tell my story. Yeah. And, and to help out. Plus, when people come on the podcast, I always like it. When the story's there to tell, and it was always like... So do you like calling moves or telling... You're a big main event I announcer. Yeah, I don't like calling moves at all. You I like s- telling the stories and yeah. making fun of people. That, yeah, it's great. You have Bianca Belair on yet? I interviewed her at the uh, Ooh, PC yesterday. how'd that go? It was awkward, but it was, was good. Was I asked yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was actually... I felt very rewarded because at TakeOver, uh, 
you know, we were outside for the pre-show mm-hmm. and the audience was there and everything. And we actually played it on the radio because I hadn't heard the TV feed, obviously. But we played it on the radio because uh, Jim wanted to hear it. And when Charlie goes, you know, to my left here is Sam Roberts, the last professional broadcaster. Audible, with the music still playing, Audible, NXT Universe, boom! But you like that, though. Love it. You love being hated. Love it. Do you know why Sam's arms are so long? To embrace all those that hate him. Bring him in. Yeah, bring, bring him in, in for a big hug. Because like Ply said, if you ain't got haters, you ain't popping. I don't know what that means, but I do know <laughs> that if you don't have people hating you, you're not doing anything right. And guess what? I'm doing so much you're doing, right. You're doing something right. And you know what? Somewhere, there's not that many people that hate you. It doesn't seem like. I feel like social media loves you. But I'm sure there are people somewhere that hate you because you are doing things right. Sure. And and I appreciate anybody that always tweets. If you watch Raw and you send me any feedback, I usually don't read it because I don't get on social media. But I do go through. I don't sit there and try to read every single thing. I'll sure. go through there and scroll like maybe for four or five minutes after the show to calm down. Kind of get what the collective opinion and, is. And I, don't, and I try to, if someone sends something nice or even – you know, creative or critique, I try to get back to them. Mm-hmm. I really do. And, um, but I, I appreciate anyone that watches Raw and, and bro, and, you're and too is, big for that, that right been. now. You're the lead guy on Raw. Okay, you don't need to. You don't need to deal with any of these people anymore. That's not true. You're See, don't upset <laughs> them. <laughs> I, it's funny because people go, "Oh, he, he he's he's sold out or he's he's so different." If you ask my collective group of friends that are close to me, they laugh and they go, "He's never changed. Mm-hmm. He does the same stupid jokes. I still eat in the same pizza shop. By the way, I own a pizza shop, which is not the pizza shop I eat in. Um, cheap plug. <laughs> you, you know, yours. but it's it's like I still go to the same ice cream place. I still live in the same city. I, I've never changed. I never will change because at the end of the day, I have this seat that you've talked about because I'm a wrestling fan. I love it. Wise words from Vic Joseph. Thanks a lot, man. Thank you, Sam. I really do appreciate it. Of course.